I need to begin by saying that I probably have forgotten more about the park than most of you know now. It's just gone, you know? These things happen. But I do have some very comprehensive notes, and I have some material that was written by Chet Bode in 1993. Chet uh, was a former county planner, a city planner in Port Bragg. He was once director of the Botanical Gardens. He's now an appraiser and a freelance writer, and uh, he's lived in this area with his family since the mid-1970s, and he and I got together now 15 years ago, and we talked about what we remembered, and then he did a lot of research into things that I just had forgotten. So, I want to tell you, though, that when our family first came here in 1959, we rented a house north of town up in Indian Shoals. And there were about three houses there at the time, and there was really nothing between Russian Gulch and Indian Shoals. There were no houses, nothing like that. And it was a July, and the weather was absolutely gorgeous. I, I've never seen it like that since. <laughs> Brilliant sunshine every single day. Our daughter was young, and we spent a lot of time on the beach at Russian Gulch and walking up the trails at Russian Gulch. And we never came to Mendocino. We, we came in on a foggy night, and we just used the old road that went through. And We didn't come to Mendocino. We just had no need. But as we were getting ready to leave for home, my husband said, you know, I really need to mail some of this stuff that I've been writing this summer. Do you suppose there's a post office down there? I said, well, let's go and look. So we drove down, and sure enough, we found the post office on Mean Street. And it was, you walked in through kind of a long, narrow place, and in the back were the boxes and the desk where people were. And when we came back out, because we were hit by the sunshine, we were hit by the headlands. Here it was, standing, and it was just absolutely magnificent. And I said, I wonder who owns that? And Hugo said, well, let's, let's go and ask. So we went back in and we talked to Don Burleson, who was then the postmaster, and he told us that the Union Lumber Company had acquired it in, what does it say here, 1852. And it was about the same time that Jerome Ford built the sawmill at Big River. And uh, we thought, well, that's great. There are no logs on this. Nobody's going to log it. It's just going to be empty forever. And we thought we just didn't pay any more attention. Every time we came into town after we moved up here, there was the headlands and everything was lovely. And that lasted for about 10 years. And then in 1968, early in the year, there was a notice in the paper that Boise Cascade had bought out all the holdings of Union Lumber Company. Now, Boise Cascade was a big international forest products company and also a developer. And the rumor spread around town that Boise Cascade was going to put condominiums on the headlands and they were going to build a big hotel. And, you know, nobody ever saw any plans from that. I'm sure they never did. But nobody needed to see them. <laughs> you know, just the very idea that somebody was going to build this stuff was more than any of us could imagine. And so, this a movement began led by Emmy Lou Packard, who was a local artist and activist. And the village had grown quite a bit. There had been sawmills all along in the coves all the way. But by this time, there was only one large mill left, and that was in Fort Bragg. And uh, it was until recently, I guess, owned by Georgia Pacific. At, but Mendocino itself, had been discovered and rediscovered many times. Mm -hmm. In the 1920s, there were the very first of the early tourists. And they came up in their cars that sometimes made it and sometimes didn't, from what I could read, on roads that were sometimes good and sometimes not so good. And they, uh, you know, it, it sort of 
there wasn't much going on there really until about 1958 or so when Bill Zaka came, founded the Art Center, and uh, I think it goes without saying that if it hadn't been for Bill, probably things wouldn't have developed very much because he then brought his artist friends up. They took residence here. But prior to that, in the 50s, there were the beatniks, the movie makers, uh, artists, lots of artists began to come. Then in the 60s came the hippies and the flower children who moved out onto the communes. And the 70s brought the back to the land people and they bought larger acreages when they could and lived on them. And then in the 1980s, the bed and breakfast people came and they <laughs> took over. <laughs> but Emmy Lou Packard was an artist and an activist. And she is honored by the black by the bronze plaque, which we all know on the headlands, which credits her vision and perseverance for the preservation of the headlands. She really started it all. I just can't say enough about her. She was absolutely magnificent. She knew everybody. She knew who to write. She spread the word. She got some of her artist friends, and I think kids from the high school and other people around town to work with her. They wrote letters. They sent out petitions. They, uh, they just worked and worked until the word finally reached all around the country. And I know you've all seen this and heard, read the quote from C. Malcolm Watkins, who was a historian at the Smithsonian Institution. He wrote at the end of 1968, I do not think it is an overstatement that it appears just as important for California to have Mendocino preserved and guarded against encroachments as it was for Virginia to have Williamsburg restored and protected. Now this story made headlines in all the Bay Area papers. The San Francisco Chronicle ran a lead article about it. KGO and KQED came up. We sat on the steps in Emmy Lou's studio and they did a small television presentation about it. The Sacramento Bee published a feature article about it. So after that was, was done, everybody knew about the headlands. There were uh, a number of local people who were very active in the early days. I, I just don't remember all of them, but among them was John Trittenbach from the Presbyterian Church, Lauren Denon, who owned Heritage House, uh, Jerry and Bill Grader, who owned the Fish Company in Fort Bragg. Um, let's see, maybe you can remember some of them. I can't. But we were lucky in that we had two local lawyers, Hal Irish and Bob Raymond, and they sort of kept us legal. You know, you'd be inclined to go off the deep end and say, we can do this, we can do that. And they'd say, no, 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 no. You have to remember, people have property rights, and you can't do that kind of thing. You have to be a little more careful. But by this time, uh, we had a, this Headlands Park Committee appointed, and it was appointed by William Penn Mott, who was then director of state parks. I began serving as chair. I got elected to the job the one week I didn't go to a meeting. <laughs> we all know that story. She's not here. We'll give her that job. Among the, uh, just move on here. Uh, well, we also had a couple of Berkeley professors. We had Frank Patelka, who was a biologist, and Hans Janney, who was a soil scientist. Also, Whitney Allen, who was just coming in to his own as a bird carver and late, later became nationally known. Uh, I, and, we, and we really moved pretty fast. I mean, people were excited about it, and there was a lot going on. But you need to know that not everybody was in favor of a Headland State Park. I met a woman on Main Street one day. She owned a shop. And I said to her, have you signed the petition? Wouldn't you like to sign the petition for Headlands Park? No, she said. 
I heard there was going to be a hotel out on the headlands. Give us some place to go dancing on Saturday nights. <laughs> but the local movement mostly was led by the local judge of the district court. And he was very vocal. He had a good following. They sort of objected to a number of things. Mainly, if we had a park, for some reason they thought taxes would go up. Uh, they also felt they didn't want state parks and recreation acting like Big Brother and telling them what to do. If somebody wanted to build a building, let them build it. That was their right. They also were, they objected pretty strenuously. There was a local incorporation movement going on in 1968. They objected to that. They knew that was going to bring more taxes. This part proposal, in order to really make headway, had to be approved by the Mendocino County Board of Supervisors and by the Resource Committee in both houses of the legislature. And that was my job to do that and go over and, and convince them. And I was at a Board of Supervisors meeting one day, the third or fourth time I'd been over there talking to them about it. And that was the day that Judge Hathcote came over to present the opposite side. And he sat at the very front of the room. He spread all his papers out on the table in front of him. And he made a speech uh, saying, we don't want this park, and gave reasons for it. And every time anyone from the board would ask a question, he made another little speech about how bad this was. And I'm trying to edge my way toward the front so I could say something. And finally, there was a woman whose name was Mrs. Butler, and she came from Anderson Valley. She was the only woman on the board. And she said, Judge, I think it's time to let the park lady speak. Mm -hmm. So I got a chance to make my presentation, and mm -hmm. I had the park lady title for a while after that. Emmy Lou and her husband, Byron, owned the big uh, White House across from the Presbyterian Church. And Emmy Lou later built a studio in the back. I think they came here about 1959. And it was in that studio where we worked uh, gathering signatures, writing letters, and doing all this kind of thing. The first thing I did, or one of the first things, I had a friend who was head of the State Department of Recreation. Her name was Rudd Brown. And I wrote and asked her, you know, what could we do to get some money if that was necessary to buy this headlands? And she said, well, the state doesn't have any money to buy anything. I suggest you try for a land swap. Well, I, people kind of perked up their ears about this was because we knew there was no, we didn't know where there would be local money to buy it. So we began to have beginning negotiations. I guess they were not even negotiations in the beginning, just some talks with Boise Cascade about the possibility of swapping the headlands for some piece of land which they might want to have. But at the time, William Penn Mott, who uh, was in charge of this for State Park, said that that the state park idea was, would be totally dependent upon establishing the community as a historic district. He did, he and state parks people did not want just anything. And then they always mentioned McDonald's and Taco Bell. We don't want those on Main Street, you know. And he uh, came up with a plan, or the parks department came up with a plan, in which they proposed buying all the property on the on Main Street, leasing it back, and then uh, restricting vehicles would be only a walking place, and even maybe restoring the sawmill. But when that plan was presented, everybody was upset. Nobody liked the idea of the parks people owning the whole of Main Street. We all could think of Columbia, where the parks does own the t that part of the town, and all the shopkeepers dress in costumes of the gold rush era. Well, people, people in Mendocino were too independent to think of anything like that. 
And so we just said, no, you know, we, we can't have that. We have to have something else. So he kept pushing the idea of a historic district and said, if you don't have it, we can't have a park because we just, we just have to be sure that the town develops in a way which is compatible with what's here now. And compatible, compatible was the key word. Nobody ever said all the buildings have to look alike. Nobody ever said they all have to be Victorian houses. They just said compatible. And of course, Mendocino had all kinds of houses here. And so it was possible to, to consider something like that. So this, our park committee began to look for a historic ordinance that would fit the needs. And we couldn't find one, really. We wrote to people, we asked people all over the state. If there was one, we never found it. And so we set about doing one that we thought would fit. And we really worked a long time on that. And that's when our legal people were very helpful. When we'd say, no, they can't, we won't let them do this, they can't do that, we need to have this, they'd say, no, be more careful, be more cautious with what you're doing. Be sure that you get something that people can live with. So we finally hammered something out and we passed it. Didn't really please any of us, but it was what we had and what we were going to work with. The, you know, it was adopted by the whole committee. I guess you might almost call it a, neg a negative consensus. And we, uh, that was what there was to work with. The review board was appointed by the Board of Supervisors. It was to be a five-person board. At the beginning, the terms were open-ended. People came on, and I guess they just stayed until they got worn out, and they left. Mm -hmm. Later on, that was refined, and I understand now that they served, served three-year terms, maybe and only two terms, so that no one is on there for longer than six years. And that, that's been working, in my view, I think it's been working extremely well. There are always problems. Isn't nothing, no ordinance is going to please everybody. But they, the board holds its regular meetings. They've refined the ordinance tremendously. Uh, how old is it now? 35 years, 30 or 35 years old. It works. Mm -hmm. The town looks perfectly beautiful. And so there was something good that came out of that ordinance. When it came time to decide what kind of land trade was going to happen, that was something that the park committee really had very little to do with. These were negotiations between uh, Boise Cascade and uh, Parks and Recreation. They sent a resource man here, a finance man here, and they worked on this for a long time. And the first thing they proposed was that Boise Cascade would exchange the headlands and 1,632 acres from Ten Mile Beach almost up to Leggett. And in, in return, they would get some prime logging land in the Hare Creek drainage. We didn't know for sure what that was going to be, but Parks did not want the land from 10 Mile north to Leggett. They said there was not enough land for people to use, and they were interested only in you know, beaches and, and bluffs and cliffs where there could be trails. So that was tossed aside. And then came the big question of, well, what else can we get if we're not going to take that? I have to say that Bill Grader, who was at that time an acting resource director of, of, for the state, was just great. He knew everybody around Sacramento, and he particularly knew Randolph Collier, who was the uh, Senate chair of the Resources Committee. And he went to Randolph and said, we've got to find something that these people can have if we're going to give up logging land. Well, Collier's district had just been changed 
and instead of being an inland uh, senator, his land was to include a lot, lot of the North Coast. And so he came over with most of the park committee, with Bill Mott, with the resource director from state parks, with their finance man, with several members of the state legislature. And we had an all-day tour. And we had already made up our minds, let's try for the land from Pudding Creek to 10 Mile. And see, well, it turns out Boise Cascade thought that would be fine. By this time, their road was eroding away, and they couldn't use it anymore. So there was the 630-some acres which was on the west side of the Haw Road, and it ran from just north of Pudding Creek up to 10 Mile. So finally, it always amazes me when I read these figures, this deal finally was agreed upon in 1972. Boise Cascade got 977 acres of forest, forested land in Jackson State Forest and it was then valued at $900,000. It, it was about a mile south of Highway 20, near North Fork Camp, if you know where that is. It had an estimated 20 million board feet of redwood, Douglas fir, and grand fir. That's what they wanted, and that's what they got. In return, State Parks got 659 acres, which included the Mendocino headlands and the Big River Beach west of the bridge. And this 573 acres along a four mile stretch from Pudding Creek to 10 Mile. And in 1973, the Mendocino supervisors adopted Mendocino and called it the Mendocino Historic Preservation District and by 1974, we had an operating park. Now that all sounds simple, and <laughs> by, by today's standards, you know, it really is. It was six years, something like that, five or six years, and things on the whole went along smoothly. Nobody was pleased. The Sierra Club was opposed to the land trade. The a lot of the local conservationists wanted Boise Cascade to get only one-time logging rights on land, not a piece of land, but they wanted land and that's what they got. Uh, since then, there's been a lot added to what was the original Mendocino State Park and most of this has come gradually over the years. The parks uh, acquired a hundred acres or so south of Big River. Uh, they acquired land then east of the bridge and they had plans to add other pieces of land further south. The idea originally was that they would like to uh, make Van Dam and the Mendocino Headlands Park sort of join. I don't think that's ever come. I, I don't know that the last pieces of that have ever been acquired, but there was bond money in those days, in, in the eight, eight, eighties and early nineties to buy land, and they did that. So that's what the park now contains. And they published a new plan in 1977, and all of these pieces were included in that land. By this time, Georgia Pacific had acquired Boise Cascade, and they, you know, it was a done deal by then. So they, uh, of course, had to agree with what should, what, should, what had happened. Right now, uh, the local parks people, the, uh, the ones that are more people in Fort Bragg, don't have money to really manage all these things. They hardly have money to have the park rangers do, we don't have, I guess we don't have fireside talks and lead walks and that kind of thing. I'm afraid they mostly have to act as policemen. So today, there's really very little to remind any of us 
of the kind of town that Mendocino must have been a hundred years ago. Uh, it's changed considerably and I think for the better. Buildings have been restored and painted. Fences, broken fences have been fixed. Uh, there are nice shops now. Uh, mostly, I grant you, geared to tourists. We're always we're always looking for a shoe repair shop, but we never got a shoe repair shop in Mendocino. Meaning, there's bookstores and ice cream parlors and clothing stores and the kinds of things that are helpful for all of us, but were particularly, I think, attract made attractive to the tourists. And so, in many ways, Mendocino. Uh, has developed exactly the way everybody hoped it would. There isn't a phone pole or a power line in sight. pg e offered to underground power, and uh, this was accepted by most people, but even that was controversial. At the time, people were saying, but if you put all the lines underground, where will the birds sit? <laughs> <laughs> but I think today, Mendocino is, uh, and the headlands, if, if you walk out on the headlands on a clear day, you can really see all the way out to the curvature of the earth. The great wheels are still going back and forth as they've done for forever, I guess. If you look north, 70 miles, you can see Cape Mendocino which is the westernmost point of land in the continental United States. The Point Cabrillo Lighthouse still blinks on and off. And it's just, it's just an amazing place as far as I'm concerned. And I hope that some of you will ask me some questions about things I may have skipped because, as I say, I've forgotten a lot. Yeah. You mentioned that um, in the beginning, Sierra Club was opposed to uh, the, the swap, and I'm just curious what their grounds were. Well, their grounds were like other people. They didn't think Boise Cascade should be given any land. They should be giving one, given one-time logging rights. Mm -hmm. well, Boise Cascade was not going to accept that. Yeah? How did it come about that the district became Mendocino? and Edlands Historic District. It became it came about because state parks would not accept the Headlands as a park unless the town had historic preservation. And so the park committee, and there were lots of people on that committee, Mendocino and Fort Bragg people, who put together an ordinance. This ordinance was passed by the Mendocino Board of Supervisors. And that's the present ordinance that covers the district now. But in 1971, it was accepted by the U.S. Department of the Interior? No, not the no. It, it, this is all state. But in the, the district was accepted by parks because that was part of the deal. No park, no, no historic district, no park. So we had to get a historic district and boundaries had to be drawn for it. But it had to be the le our legal entity was the Mendocino County Board of Supervisors, and they had to approve it, and they did. They approved it in 1973. <coughs> yeah. While you were talking, my mind went a couple of times up to Fort Bragg, where 40 years later, there's that incredible, beautiful stretch of headlands that's owned by um, coal industries. I don't think anybody knows quite what they do. Um, None of these things are in place any longer. There's, there's no possibility, is there, that, I mean, there's not the bond money, there's... Could something like this happen there? Do you ever, do you see that as a possibility? I mean, well, for one thing, it's much larger. Uh -huh. So I think it's probably going to, my personal view is there ought to be a park up there. There ought to be mm -hmm. trails along the headlands. Mm -hmm. And I understand the Coastal Conservancy gave some money to have a trail go along there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you, in the whole view of things, this is a small park, mm -hmm. and it was a, an entity that people could latch onto, and everybody who came into town could see it. Mm -hmm. Nobody can see what's in Fort Bragg. That's true. I have no but I, and I expect it'll take a lot of hard work by a lot of people mm -hmm. 
to do there'll be some commercial development no doubt about it <clears throat> you know and, you know when 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 the portion of of the park included all that land west of the hall road mm -hmm. there were already one or two things on the east side of that road and you know that road's developed there are big motels up there and, and that's okay you can still walk the hall road and and get out on the beaches right so there there's going to have to be some kind of adjustment made certainly right helen um did you and your husband buy any after you came up here did you buy any acreage yourself yeah we bought 20 acres on the country road and the reason we, we bought it out there was that the second summer we came to spend, we expected the same glorious summer, <laughs> and we didn't get it. We had 30 days of fog from morning till night and all night long. And so we began to drive out and look, and we'd see sun out there, and we'd say, oh, it's going to be sunny when we get back. Well, it was not. So we decided we would prefer to live in where there was more soil. Also, my husband wanted a garden, and you couldn't garden on the bluffs very well. So we bought 20 acres on the country road, and that's where I lived until three years ago. Yep. I live on Middle Ridge and Albion, which at mm -hmm. one time was where the Albion Nation was. Yeah, all the yeah. yeah. And neighbors of ours uh, remember when Mr. Mott, from California's viewpoint, wanted to turn Mendocino into the, quote, Williamsburg of the West. Oh, yes. And have everybody wearing those wearing costumes. The costumes. These hippies and flat <laughs> Forget that. They, were the, they weren't the only ones. When this plan was presented, there was a big meeting at the high school, and I remember that Lauren did and chaired that meeting. And when that plan was presented, you could hear, you could feel, oh, this, we can't have that. <laughs> we didn't want Mendocino to have people go dressed in costumes. We wanted it to be a town that would live and grow, and, and it has. But protecting the... But protecting the important parts of it, uh, like the headlands. You know. Yeah. I, uh, I've been visiting the headlands for a number of years, and the native plant community on the north bluffs is just absolutely absolutely so beautiful and then there are native plants all the way around the edge that are very special so not seen too often was that ever a factor did people recognize just how nice oh yes i guess i forgot to say i knew there'd be something i forgot mm -hmm. wheatley allen and uh frank patelka who was a botanist biologist they uh inventoried a lot of the plants mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, that has to be somewhere I don't know where, but it's been done, yes. And I know that the classes now from the College of the Redwoods come down from time to time. Yeah. I'm going back again to my question because um, right now, Mendocino Study Club, of which we're very proud to, we're a member for many years, <laughs> we're doing a plaque for the Ford House with permission of the park department mm -hmm. saying um, Mendocino and Headlands Historic District National Register of Historic Places but the date preceded the county it was well I, I'm sure that's right because it, it it became it got on the National Register and I'm not sure of what year it was 71. Uh, but uh, it wasn't until 73 that the board, see, we couldn't have a review board to, to look at what was going on without it being approved by the county. Was, was the your committee was not the um, instigators of applying to be on the National Register? That was the work that was done by Malcolm Watkins and, and, and his people, well, mostly. Well, you. I didn't know that. Well, I guess I didn't know it either, but he, he had been very active. And then, of course, I mean, just the letter that he wrote that got such national publicity, and, and that's how that came to be. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. so, so the board's involvement was really approving and establishing the uh, historical review board, mm -hmm. they didn't. They didn't in a sense identify us as a 
historical district uh, that had already been no that was done by the state okay. but it had to be approved by the board and it had to be approved as well by both houses of the legislature and i went over both times to those hearings i have to tell you a funny story about that too i went over first to um the assembly and frank Bellotti was our assemblyman at that time and he saw me come in and he came up and he escorted me to the front of the room and he told people who i was and what we were doing and asked me to make a presentation and and then he asked if there were any questions and or anybody had anything to say and they voted and they voted unanimously to approve the concept of the park then i went across to the senate and uh, Randolph Collier was the senator then, and he sort of looked at me and waved, you know, he guessed he knew who I was. But he made the presentation for the park. I just stood there with my papers in my hand. And when he finished, he said, um, let the gavel up like this. Any questions? Any comments? Mm -hmm. It's passed. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way that went. <laughs> Go through all the agencies, all right. So. <laughs> yes? Uh, was the population uh, lesser or more at the time mm -hmm. in the 70s here or in the 60s? In the actual I I don't know specifically I don't think the population has changed a lot has it there, there, never, there never haven't been that many new buildings well, <laughs> but what has happened is that many homes that were lived in by local residents were bought by out of town well that's the second home to the vacation rent. that's so if anything the population living within the boundaries it's of probably much less. less yeah yeah yeah, because we look, we're not, in the years that we lived out on the Comfrey Road, there were lots of pl places that were built out there from time to time, but not many in town. No, no and the occasional house. Up Little Lake Road. Yeah, Little Lake Road is another place where there are lot. Well, I thank you for asking me to come. Mm -hmm. I think I've told you all I know. Mm -hmm. I'm going up and look at that display up there and then see what I can find out that I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.